Some may trust in horses. Some may trust in chariots. Oh, oh but I, I'm going to trust in the name of the Lord. Some trust in their riches. Some may trust in all they own. Oh, but I, I will trust in the name of the Lord. There is one working power, Holy Spirit power, great redeeming power, power in the name, resurrection power. Good morning, everyone. I'll go back. There we go. We're kind of a small group this morning, aren't we? Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. It's a, it's a good, good to be here. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and this is a special day that we, we gather. The church remembers and celebrates the historic event of God giving his spirit into the church. And that's a big thing. As we think about the role and the work of the Holy Spirit, how the Spirit of God uh, really calls us and gathers us and enlightens us with his gifts and sanctifies us and preserves us, all the things, all the wonderful aspects of the work of the Spirit of God that we oftentimes take for granted. And today we can just celebrate that as part of gathering. And so as we do gather today, know that we gather in his name and we celebrate that. I invite you to stand as we sing about the victory we have in Christ.
we gather this morning, we gather and we confess together Psalm 6. So let's confess. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed and he has put on strength as his belt. Floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. All your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Father, thank you that you are mighty. And Father, on this Pentecost Sunday that we celebrate the work of the Spirit in our lives, we're so thankful, Lord, that the mighty God dwells in us. And Lord, all the things that we deal with in life, all the ups and downs and all the baggage that we've even brought in this morning and just the reality of life, thank you, Father, that you are on the throne, that you are mighty. And as we deal with our sin and as we deal with our failures and as we deal with life, Lord, remind us once again who you are. And as you have gathered us in here today, may you use this time to bring life to us. May you use this time to bring peace and nourishment for our weary souls. May you equip us, strengthen us, and minister to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Pentecost Day, we are also reminded of who God is as triune, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all the work in which that means and the amazing reality of who God is. And that's really captured in the creeds that we say every Sunday, right? These are all Trinitarian in form. 
And so let's confess this, knowing that we are not only def- like confessing the identity of God, but then the work of God as well, that is alive in you today and me as well. So let's confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. You might notice that there's a lot of red up here <laughs> and all the way around, right? Red is the historic color for Pentecost, fire, right? And it brings us back to chapter 2, the, the tongues of fire resting on, you know, the, the, the heads, it's the, 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 the sign of life, right? And again, it's all the things that we think about the work of the Holy Spirit, calling us, gathering us, converting us, sanctifying us, preserving us, and all those great things. So red, as you see red, is think of fire, think of life, right? The work of the Spirit in your life. A couple of things to make known of today. Next Sunday is, uh, we're just going to have a fun family night. Nothing super big deal about it. It's just we're going to come at 5 o'clock. Uh, we're going to grill some burgers, and we're just going to play. So that's for everybody, maybe card games or whatever, kickball kind of things or whatever. Uh, but 5 o'clock, hopefully we have some good weather. Obviously, if the weather is not good, we probably won't do that. And we'll just bump it to another time. Uh, but that's uh, June 12th, and we look forward to that. We were going to do a kind of a youth presentation today, but Tara's not feeling well, so we're going to bump it to next week. But there's a youth gathering the 26th of June, end of the month. So just kind of mark that down, kind of a fun yard night for them too. Uh, as they stop meeting, they're just going to do kind of one-off things for the summer and into uh, VBS time as well. Summer Kids Club, that's coming. There's, there's a, kind of a poster board over there. If you're wanting to participate, can't be there that week, um, there's a way still that you can help out. So um, pay attention to that. It's a great opportunity to assist and be a part of what we're doing. It is wedding season right now, by the way. Um, so the whole Limbloom clan isn't here because they have a wedding in just a couple hours, Brad and Laura, down at the ranch. If the weather is good, otherwise it'll be at RCC uh, in the chapel. And so be praying for Brad and Laura. He texted me at about 6 this morning said, uh, please be praying for us. And uh, I don't know if that was a sign of desperation or, or what. But uh, anyway, they're, they're excited. And so pray for them. Um, yesterday in uh, Cody, Wyoming, uh, the Potos, who help us out with music, had a great opera, kind of a ceremony of reaffirming their vows, kind of a wedding service, too, that I was able to be a part of. And so, and I know there's other, a lot of weddings happening right now. This, um, so that's great. Graduations were kind of past that, I think. Um, we were going to have a graduation Sunday, but a few of our graduates aren't able to be with us. Um, so we'll, we'll keep working on getting that together. Any other announcements as we think about the nature of just the ministry here? Abby, I see that look right there. <laughs> Prayer requests. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 Yeah. Right. As we share prayer requests, I just want to affirm again, it's like we, we want to pray together, but hopefully maybe throughout your prayer life, throughout the week, maybe you'll remember those things as well. Certainly want to be praying for all the traveling right now, a lot of things taking place. Praise for all the rain, right? Right, Jeff? That's been, that's been good. Any other prayer requests, praises? Let's go to the Lord then. Father, thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, your spirit that is at work in us. Lord, we, we would not be here without your spirit. And so we're thankful for your dwelling among us and in us and how you unite us in Christ. Lord, what an amazing reality. Lord, that we are not just left alone, that you are not distant from us. Lord, but you are very, very with us. 
Lord, help us remember, Lord, that every day, Lord, that we are not alone, that we, your spirit is in us and in one another. <laughs> Even when we dislike that and, and are frustrated maybe with the body of Christ, Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that this is a church that you are building uh, and that we are a part of uh, the people of God all around the world. And that you are reaching people. Lord, I pray for the church right around Rapid and around South Dakota and the state and the country and the world. Lord, we, we pray that you would just continue to build that church, bring renewal and revival. Lord, give us wisdom, give us clarity. Pray that you would just do your work, Father. Father, we think of all those that are traveling today for different events, weddings, different things. We pray that you bless them. We think of Brad and Laura specifically, and as they enter into this amazing journey of marriage, Lord, just bless them, and I pray that it would just be honoring to you, and just give them peace. Um, for the potos yesterday of just reaffirming those vows that they've made before, bless them as well, and just to guide other unspokens that are in our hearts today that are giving us concern and pause and worry. Lord, you know us. You know what's going on. Nothing can be hidden from you, Father. Lord, give us faith to trust you every day. Lord, we think of, we think of John. We pray for that surgery and for Amy too. And, and Lord, we know that you know what's going on there. We pray for wisdom and healing and, and peace, Father. Lord, we just guide, ask that you would guide us this day, guide our time together, guide your word. May it do its work in our hearts today. And again, Lord, may you just bring your life to us and renew us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, kids, come on up. Ooh, snuck right in there. <laughs> oh, my. Cool. It's a magic lamp. I, this is the first time we've had a, a, a lamp. Um, so, okay, Benny, tell me the truth. Do you ever open this up waiting for a genie to come out? Uh, no. No? How about, how about you, Emma? Are you sure? Um, Brianna probably does, though, right? Emma, so, that thing is from Aladdin. It's from Aladdin. That's what, like, that, that's what I was thinking about. That's what I was thinking about the whole genie thing, right? And so what do you actually do with this, though? You, you take that thing off. Right, I get that. But, like, is it in your bedroom at home? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah? It, it's even on your desk. Okay, it's on your desk. So, all right. So, what is, what, you, got, you, got, you want to hold it? Okay. So, all right. So, we got, we got the genie, genie in the bottle kind of a thing here happening. Right? So, what, what, what's that all about? You get to make wishes, right? Is that true? Is that how it works with Aladdin? You get to make wishes? Everybody wanted that to happen? Yeah. Have you ever thought about that? What would be your wish? It's a good question for you to think about. If, if that actually could happen in real life, and I don't think it can, but if it did, what would you wish? What would you want? What do you think? A unicorn. A unicorn. All right. <laughs> Anybody else? A Pikachu. A Pikachu. All right. Benny, what would you want? If you could, if you could wish for anything. Um, I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> all right, let me hold it. Okay. Well, here's the. Th you want to see the lamp real quick? Okay. All right. Fine. Okay. All right. So you know, our our God. Is, sometimes we we approach God this way, like God is some sort of a genie in the in the bottle, and we just all we ever do is just ask him for stuff, and we think that that's all he's there for. We think God is just there to be our kind of personal waiter to grant us whatever we want, whenever we want it, however we want it. And yet, God's not that way. Have you guys noticed that? God's really not that way. We, we pray and we ask and God wants to know our hearts. But, but at the end of the day, God says, my will be done, right? And that's what he wants for you guys and for all of us here. That as we want things in life, as we wish for things, we can ask God. But then says, like, Lord, your will be done. Your will be done. You know why that's a good thing? It's because God is so much stronger than some silly genie, right? He's the God of the universe that knows exactly what's going on and really knows everything about you and what you really need. So he's better than a genie. And sometimes he even lets us go through struggles because he's doing good things in us. Okay? So as you guys pray, think of God not as some sort of genie in a bottle, but as a sovereign, all-powerful God that knows exactly what you need. And sometimes that when you pray, he says yes. Sometimes he says no. And sometimes he says wait. Okay? 
So that's a good reminder. That's what I'm thinking about as I see this. All right, Benny. There you go. Let's see. I'm not going to give it back to you. You brought that. All right, you go get a treat, though. <laughs> Father, thank you for this time now to dive into your word. Lord, we pray that you give us clarity and wisdom uh, for this time and this uh, series for the summer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so... I hope you like stories. I, I love stories. I think we all do. We're built to love stories. And, you know, whoa, that's just getting ahead of me. Okay. So, we're, yeah, we're built to love stories and the suspense and the drama and the character development and all those types of things. The surprises of stories, right? Stories allow us to enter into them. Do they not? To think about them, to experience what the characters are all about, to learn from them. We all read stories, whether we read or we watch or listen or whatever. Over the next few weeks this summer, I've just kind of chosen to dive into one of my favorites, okay, in, in the scriptures, one of, my, one of the great narratives that I think and that, that I love personally, and, and, and I think it's a, it's a narrative, it's a story that I believe is so relevant for us right now in our culture, in this cultural moment. And so we're going to follow a man that's, man, he's just unlike anything else, right, that came before him. And, and we're going to try to, as best we can, place ourselves into his day into his culture, and to observe and to learn what we can and how to take that into our day today. So we're going to be talking about Elijah, obviously, right? To do so, we're going to be traveling back into a section of the Bible that is oftentimes neglected. Let's just be honest, right? It's, it's an area, though, that contains some of the greatest narratives in all of the Scripture. It's the historical books, right? And there's just a wealth of insight about who God is as well as who, are, who we are, and so as we begin this study, just kind of a little disclaimer here, uh, Elijah was sent to turn people upside down. And, and so he, he was sent to rouse people from their slumber. And, and so some of the things that we're going to be talking about are probably going to step on our toes. It's kind of designed to be that way. Some of what we're going to talk about is probably going to really going to challenge us and maybe even challenge what we believe. And that's okay too. And so my prayer as we jump into this over the, really the summer is that our hearts and our minds would just be open to this again. And, and maybe this is a familiar story for, for some of you, maybe, maybe not, but just uh, prayers allow God to work in our lives. Our story begins in 1 Kings 17, 17. So as you can see, chapter 17 is smack dab in the middle of the book, right? Now, sometimes it's pretty easy when studying in the Old Testament to lose our bearings. Has that ever happened to any of you before? You lose your bearings because the Old Testament, it spans so many years, so many different people, so many different things are taking place. Sometimes the books are overlapping. And, and, and so it's really good for us to just get our historical setting and getting our framework because as we do that, as that is done, it enables us to sort of transport our minds and our hearts and place ourselves smack dab into the middle of what's happening in the, in the narrative, as if we're all just sort of watching it unfold right before our very eyes. In short, the text comes alive, right? And so as we begin, I want to spend the time setting up some historical context. I love history, and I know a lot of you absolutely love history. If you don't, sorry, we're doing it anyway. History, though, is sometimes not pretty, right? It can be ugly. And in fact, it can be really ugly. And that's what we're going to kind of see at the outset here. Uh, if I were to ask you, who are the big three kings in Israel? Who would you say? <laughs> no. All right. I, I heard Saul. I heard Saul, right? He stabilized the kingdom. And then what came next? David, right? The greatest conqueror. And then what came next? Solomon, peacetime and building the temple. So usually those are the three big guns that you think of. Okay. Uh, today, it, I'm going to ask you a, a totally unfair question, unless you're a nerd, and I know some of you are. Anyone know what happened in approximately 924 BC? Come on now, anybody? I know some of you know this. Nice, good work. Yeah, the kingdom was divided, okay? So what happened? King Solomon dies, okay? And the kingdom is relatively in decent shape economically, and yet because of the idolatry that was introduced into his last days, there are seeds sown that were going to create some problems. And so Rehoboam, his son, succeeded Solomon on the throne. And he's only 41 years old. And, and the northern tribes of Israel called an assembly at, at Shechem, 
and, and they're wanting to ratify this new king. But before they pledge allegiance to Rehoboam as their king, they want to take care of some business. And the leadership of the northern tribes were kind of disgruntled because Solomon, well, frankly, he taxed them really high. And he did some other things. It's just kind of a heavy yoke, right? And so they request to Rehoboam, just, can you just be nicer to us, relieve some of this burden? And, and, and if the relief was offered, then the elders would pledge their allegiance and everything would be happily ever after, right? Um, pretty simple. His response is anything but gracious. This is Rehoboam. And he said this in response to being asked, can you just be nicer to us? My father, that's Solomon, made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. Pretty tactful, right? Pretty tactful. So you know what happened. Obviously, you keep reading in 1 Kings 12. All Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, and the people answered to the king, what portion do we have with David, right? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. And just like that, boom, it's split. The kingdom was split. Two of the 12 tribes remained loyal to Rehoboam as they were living in proximity to Jerusalem. We call them Judah. And the other 10 tribes, the northern tribes, right? We call them Israel. And so the story of Elijah takes place then in that northern kingdom, in the, in the kingdom of Israel. And so 924 BC, we have this split. And one of the first actions then of the northern tribe was to crown a king. You need a king, right? And so you have King Jeroboam. Right? Jeroboam's first concern as the king of Israel is to find a capital. You gotta have a you gotta have a place, right? So he fortified Shechem as the most prominent city in the north. His second concern was actually pretty interesting as well. It was pretty political, and yet it just sort of had a religious cover to it. And he created a new religion, right? He created a new religion in the north, which was designed to then rival the divinely revealed you know, religion practiced in Jerusalem. And this is really interesting. It's very pragmatic of him. He feared that, you know, if we're in the north here, and if the people keep traveling back to Jerusalem, back to the temple three times a year, to all the major festivals, their allegiance is not going to be to us. I'm going to lose power. And so Jeroboam then centered his new religion on two golden calves, and he created shrines for these two uh, um, calves and two very convenient locations. We had Dan and Bethel, and he unleashed his propaganda machine all throughout the kingdom, attempting to persuade people to change their allegiance, their religious affiliation, and overall, the people just zealously went after it. And Jeroboam built shrines and places for these people of this new faith. And he made priests from every class of people, not just the class of Levi. And Jeroboam himself even officiated as a high priest, offering sacrifices and incense during special occasions for the calves that he had built, which is kind of ironic. Every aspect of this new religion was basically devised in his own heart. And the people just blindly followed it. Okay? Okay. Now, time does not allow us to go too much more into detail with that, but I will make a mention of some of the kings here, okay? This is really interesting. Uh, Jeroboam ruled 22 years, right? And his son Nadab took the crown when Jeroboam died, and he continued the evil practices of his father. And the, the, the scripture says he did evil in the sight of the Lord. His rule lasted only two years, and he was assassinated, okay? The next king was Basha. Basha launched a bloody purge that utterly wiped out the house of Jeroboam, right? Because that's what you do. Okay, eliminating all potential rivals, and he continued the practices of the previous kings, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. His reign lasted 24 years, pretty long time, actually. Then he died. His successor was Elah, and he reigned only two years. He was also a wicked king, as the scripture says. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. And his demise came when one of his military officers, Zimri, the commander of half the Israelite force, conspired against him and assassinated him. Okay. So two years, then he's gone. Then you got Zimri, the commander that assassinated Allah, becomes king. And as soon as Zimri gets in there, you know, so this is about 885 BC, he orders all male relatives of Allah to be executed. And this action then would, of course, eliminate, you know, potential rivals to the throne. And he even goes a step beyond that. And he executed all the friends of the royal house. Anyone who he might just sort of suspect as being sympathetic to Allah. His rule lasted a week, <laughs> right? And then he you know, committed suicide. Oh, he was killed, right? So he committed suicide because the army that was led by Omri had heard about all the craziness that was happening and he comes back to try to overthrow him. So Zimri spends seven days basically killing people, <laughs> okay? And so following Zimri's suicide, you have the civil war breaks out for four to five years and eventually Omri wins. Do you kind of get the picture of what's taking place here? This is kind of messy, 
At any rate, Omri becomes king, and King Omri is a super fascinating study. The writer of King only uses four verses to describe him, but we have all these other historical documents that talk about the kingdom of Omri. And he was actually a very, very successful king in the physical sense. In fact, he's one of Israel's most prominent kings, according to ancient literature. And he moved the capital then from Shechem to Samaria in this new fortified city that he built. It's interesting that scripture then doesn't say anything about all these worldly accomplishments. It just says he did more evil. <laughs> he did more evil. Omri did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did more evil than all who were before him. He walked in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nabath, in the sins that he had made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger by their idols. In other words, worldly success and everything that Omri was, wasn't that awesome to God. Faithfulness was, Right? Omri's reign lasted 12 years until about 874 BC. And then we come to Ahab, who's the, one of the main characters in our story. This is his son, Ahab. And he took over king. And Ahab's reign was about 22 years. And it starts in about 1 Kings 16. And Ahab continued the wonderful, long-lasting tradition of all the previous kings of doing more evil than the previous one. All right? Ahab bettered them all in their evil. And besides continuing the idolatry of calf worship, he marries Who? Jezebel, right? This fanatical worshiper, worshiper of Baal. And she led Ahab then into all the corruption of Canaanite idolatry. And he pursues this program of reinstituting worship and the practices of the Canaanites, the very people that Yahweh had driven out of the land. He erects temples and altars and pillars all over the place. He makes these Asherah poles, a wooden pillar symbolizing the goddess of Asherah. Canaanite theology, right? This is the, 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 the pal of Baal. He even went to try to rebuild the walls of Jericho. Remember that? Which hadn't been touched in 500 years because Joshua then pronounced a curse on whoever would do that. So by attempting to build the walls of Jericho, it's like slapping God in the face. This is Ahab. And right at the end of chapter 16, right before our narrative here, this is what 1 Kings 16.33 says, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Again, are you getting a glimpse of the situation that we are stepping into today? The northern kingdom, the Israel was a mess. Each new king did evil in the sight of the Lord. The nation is just spiraling downward. And it seems just like when you think that it can't get worse, the bottom falls out again. And the nation is descending further and further into idolatry and immorality. Images of Baal are all over the place. Idol temples and heathen altars and heathen priests are occupying sacred ground. There's unprecedented corruption everywhere. And on top of that, there was a determined effort to stamp out true faith in the Lord. In fact, worshipers of the true God are being hunted down and persecuted by sword and by fire. If there was ever a time that God needed to intervene in a mighty way to stop the stream of human history, this is one of those times. It's one of the darkest times in the history of Israel. Everything appears to be totally helpless until chapter 17, verse 1. Now, Elijah. Now, Elijah. And those words, as you're just reading from chapter 16 to 17, the words just jump off the page. And, and instantly, we as readers, we know something's about to happen here. God is about to enter into this pitiful and dark and awful situation. Out of nowhere, there's like a lightning bolt that just just dropping from heaven to earth. Elijah is there. Now, Elijah. There's no warning. There's no genealogy or anything like that. There's nothing that builds into this sort of dramatic story, this dramatic entry. Point, and little does Ahab know that his world is about ready to be thrown all over the place. So let's read this. Now Elijah, this is the verse one. That's all we're going to look at today. One verse. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except for by my word. So our journey is simple today. We're just going to look at who Elijah is and who his message is, what his message is just from the verse one. And in, in, many, in many ways, it's... Uh, not a difficult question to see who Elijah is, right? Uh, I mean, it is, sorry, it is a difficult question. We don't have a lot of information other than what we have right here. We do have three clues, and I have them bolded for you. The first clue, the historian here, the writer, says Elijah was from Tishbe, right? Okay, so if you look at your uh, map, uh, there we go. We've got that general area in Gilead. You look for the Jordan River and east of the river, you find the region of, of Gilead. 
Uh, there are sometimes in some maps, you have the, the village of Tishbe there. Uh, note the topography. It's super mountainous. Uh, parts are dense forests, things like that. So that's part of where he's from. The second clue we have in the scripture here is, is um, from 2 Kings 1. And that's just his clothing. I'll bring this text in. 2 Kings 1. What kind of man was he who came to meet you and told you these things? He answered him, he wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather around his waist. And he said, it's Elijah. Okay, so his clothing was probably not common because he was identified by it. And so we learn then from his dress that probably something along the line of poverty. He's probably not born into a wealthy family. So putting a couple pieces together here, we get a little bit of a glimpse of a man. He's probably a rugged kind of guy, probably pretty rough around the edges, probably kind of unrefined. He's probably not super educated in the eyes of the world. Remember the show Beverly Hillbillies? That's kind of what I'm imagining here, right? He's, he's probably a tough guy, hardened, probably a guy who just sticks out like crazy. Okay, if he can be identified by this garment of hair, he probably sticks out. Okay, and the third clue we have is his name. You know, names are important. We know that, right? Especially in Bible times, because they serve to sort of convey divine promises, teaching about character and disposition. They're meaningful. And so the name Elijah means the Jehovah or covenant God is my God. Jehovah is, is my God. The covenant God is my God. And that is a beautiful picture of his life and ministry. Okay, so now imagine the scene here. Go back to that text with me. Just imagine with your minds. Israel is a mess. Total corruption everywhere. Idolatry everywhere. Baal worship everywhere. They are killing people who are trying to worship the true God, right? Initiated by Jezebel. Ahab the king is sitting on the throne in his great powerful city of Samaria. Ahab is known for killing men of God. And one day out of nowhere, this rugged, hairy, strangely dressed man who probably terribly needed a bath is standing before the beauty and the grandeur of the throne of Ahab. Picture that in your mind, okay? Can you imagine the introduction, right? <laughs> Hi, King Ahab. You know, like, um, my name is Jehovah is my God, right? Uh, I've got to think that Ahab was probably a little, maybe stunned. I mean, again, put yourself in his mind. Where on earth did this guy come from? What hole did you dig him out of kind of a thing? Doesn't this guy, whatever his name is, doesn't he know that I have the power to kill him? Doesn't he know that I'm actually killing people like him? Right? Who does he think he is coming into my presence, talking to me like that? And as quickly as he drops into the scene, he speaks. And what's his message? Oh, that's there we go. There we go. As the Lord, the God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall neither be dew nor rain these years except by my word. Maybe you're thinking, that's it? Is that all he's got? Right? Is that it? Allow this message to sink in a little bit, though, because there, there's a lot of contrast that's ha- taking place here. If you break it down, this is a rather remarkable message. The first phrase, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives. There are two major components here. Uh, What are they? The first is the Lord, the God of Israel. He's referring to Yahweh, the covenant God, not some random God, right? Made up by Jeroboam or some fake God like Baal, but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the true God of Israel who, who delivered them out of captivity, that God. And this God, then the second thing he says is living as the Lord lives, As Jehovah lives in comparison to your pathetic God, Ahab, this golden set of calves, this Baal God disconnected from reality, the God of Israel is a living God, which means he is one to be feared. And note that second phrase, before whom I stand. Remember the scene in every possible way. Elijah did not, he didn't belong in this place. He did not belong standing in the presence of the wicked King Ahab. And he would normally be the last place, right? Where he would probably want to be. But Elijah's not afraid of him. He's standing before the almighty God. That's whom I represent before whom I stand, right? I'm Elijah and I'm standing before God, the living God. Ahab, you're nothing. That's what he's saying. Ahab, you're nothing. I'm not afraid of you. Because the living God that I serve, yeah, I'm his. I stand before him. And by this time, I think Ahab's blood would have probably started to boil. (laughs) This strangely dressed man, right, who's saying, talking about the the covenant God who is just, you know, Judah thing. And now he's attacking his authority, attacking their religious system. 
And he's showing that he's not even afraid of him. But Elijah's not done yet. He's got one more thing to say. There shall be neither dew nor rain these years except for by my word. My word. You see what he's doing here? This is really interesting. Baal, the God of Ahab that he had introduced, you know, with his wife Jezebel and all that kind of stuff, was the Canaanite God of fertility. And the Canaanites believed then that Baal appeared in the thunderclouds and the rainstorms. And so they set their altars on mountaintops to be closer to their God. In other words, not only was Baal viewed as the God of fertility, but he's also believed to control the rain. So the absence of rain meant the absence of Baal, very simply. Now, this strange prophet of the living God is standing in the heart of idolatry before the king saying, there's not even going to be dew, let alone rain, unless I say so. Picture that. And with this declaration, friends, Elijah, inspired and empowered by God, is declaring war on Ahab. And he's declaring war on Baal and all the false gods of Israel as if saying, my God is greater than your fake God. And to prove it, God is going to shut off the the spigot. (laughs) It's not going to happen until I say so. And there's nothing you, Ahab, or nothing your gods can do anything about. No, 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 kind of a thing, right? And just like that, he's gone. The historian doesn't give us any more. He doesn't talk about Ahab's response, although it's not hard to imagine what kind of response Ahab would have had here. But this is just the beginning. Ahab is, I mean, Elijah has just come onto the scene in such a dark area with a thunderbolt. And he just dropped a hammer on Ahab. Pretty powerful opening scene. So what do we do with this? Got two lessons today just to kind of bring us to to us. Obviously, it's a very unique situation. But I think there's some stuff here. And the first lesson is that Elijah's are needed today. And, And I'm not necessarily thinking along the lines of, us dressing in strange clothing, literally going after the king or other things like that. Obviously, this is a very specific situation, right? There's a specific context here. Uh, he might call you to do that. I don't know, but I don't think that's necessarily where we need to go today. Uh, so what am I getting at? I think the heart of this whole deal with Elijah is applicable for you and for me. And I think that can span the sands of time. What, what jumps out to me with Elijah is his stubborn obedience. Stubborn obedience. Now, in case you're thinking that maybe Elijah was some sort of superhuman, uh, James in the New Testament tells us in James 5, 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Don't let that like just go away from you. What does that mean? It means that he's human. <laughs> he's human, which also means that he has a sinful nature. And so as I reflect on verse 1 and all the historical context that we talked about and this gruesome picture of immorality and idolatry and all the darkness and all the mess of the world and the wicked nature of the king and Jezebel and all that kind of stuff, I, I kind of stand back and just sort of marvel at Elijah, Elijah here. But I got to think that this was not easy for him. Part of me wonders if, you know, when God, you know, it's not recorded for us, but when God spoke to him and told him to go and and what to say, uh, part of me wonders if his response wasn't like, you want me to do what? Right? You want me to do what? God, God, don't, don't, don't you realize that that guy is like killing people left and right? He's killing people just like me. And, And you want me, this mountain sort of man guy, to stand before him and say that everything that he is and everything that he believes is fake? God, God, are you sure that's a good idea? Maybe there's another way. I don't know if that's the kind of way the conversation went. That's kind of what I would do, though. And maybe you would, too. Right? Because if Elijah's normal, and I think he is, he's a human, right? He probably struggles with sin. And I got to believe that there's maybe some apprehension there. That's pretty normal. And yet at the end of the day, what do we see? We see obedience, obedience to the call of God. Obedience does not mean that Elijah was not apprehensive. Obedience doesn't mean that there's no fear involved, right? Obedience simply means that he was able to get past that and just trust God and he went. And despite the clash of cultures that he was about to face, despite this arrogant and dangerous king that he was going to go up against, he's just obedient to the call of God, Uh, obedient to stand for truth, obedient to stand for God against all worldly odds. And he stood before the covenant God and no other, be it man, be it government, be it trumped up religion, be anything, right? Didn't matter. And that's going to be pretty consistent throughout this narrative, okay? Now, it'd be very easy for me to just sit, pound, pound the table. You got to be like Elijah and so do I. We just got to be obedient just to be obedient. And I think that would be the wrong approach because the question here is why? 
Why was Elijah obedient? What, what led him to do that? What, what motivated him to risk absolutely everything? Right? What was his motivation? I, I believe, this is my take on it, that it was his understanding and his relationship with Yahweh, this gracious covenant God. I mean, it's just built right into his name. Elijah had been changed by God's love and mercy. Elijah had trusted God's promised Messiah's covenant. Elijah feared and loved the Lord before whom I stand, he said. He knew the Lord had that place. And he wanted the Lord to be glorified. He wanted the Lord to be honored. And he wanted others to fear God. His trust is in God and it transformed how he saw himself and it transformed how he saw his life. That's the only explanation. It wasn't just obedience for the sake of obedience. It wasn't just getting a notch in my moral belt, right? Elijah's response of obedience flowed from his relationship with God, flowed from God's love, flowed from God's mercy to him. And you know, when, as we think about the connection to you and myself today, I think there's a lot of connection. We look around, we see people, we see families, we see states, we see countries in need. We see that there's darkness and it's just palatable, right? It's a mess. And there are societal pressures that are just waging war on our souls every single day. They just beat on us left and right. You feel it, so do I. Not, not even to mention our own messed up sinful lives, right? And, and God calls us to rest in him, to find our confidence in him, not just because but because of who God is and what God has done and how he is the sovereign God on the throne who crafted us and how he has loved us and how he has died for us and how he has forgiven us and how he through the spirit dwells in us and empowers us. And all of that is why you and I can seek to live a life of obedience. Come what may, come what may. And as we work this out in the next few weeks, we're going to see opportunities on what that might look like. But, but my prayer for myself and for all of us here is that the God would work the spirit of Elijah in us. And this was a spirit that was birthed and empowered by the God who has not changed. The same God who did that with Elijah is the God that can do that with you and me. And that that spirit then would just permeate you and me. And that we would seek to live joyfully forgiven, empowered by God's spirit, and stubbornly obedient to the living God, come what may. The second lesson, I think, today is that God enters into hopeless situations. You know, it would be wrong to just focus on Elijah in this text, even though, you know, obviously he, he's kind of a main character. But the story is really about God, isn't it? Right? I mean, it's a story about God entering into the darkness of human mess and human sin. It, it's so on display. Sin doing what sin does. And sin wrecks everything. Sin confuses everybody. Sin causes wreckage of the soul. And God enters into that mess, enters into that muck, and calling people out of that into real life to himself. That's what we see here with Elijah. And, and, and perhaps many of God's people in that day thought, man, this, this is hopeless. What can we do? You know, but not from God's view. And, and, and not with God's plan, right? And I, and I think you and I, we need to hear that today, right? It is so easy for us to get discouraged and so just downtrodden by this utterly pervasive and unrelenting power of sin, not only in our lives, friends, but in the lives of others and in our society. And it's so easy for us to think, man, our country and our world and everybody, is just a mess. And we just celebrate sin. We celebrate evil and we deify our selfish desires. And there's just utter contempt that we show for one another. And there's tyranny everywhere. And the list can go on and on and on. It is so dark. Probably not as bad as Ahab dark, but it's bad. It's really bad. And sometimes we're just so good at just sort of throwing our hands up and just complaining while ignoring the God who acts, the God who acts. And that's the beauty of this passage and really this whole narrative. And frankly, the entire book of the Bible, God enters into that with a message of truth, with a message of life. And he is calling and he is gathering his people to himself. And friends, that is our hope as God breathes life into us. And we're going to talk about that a lot in the next few weeks. But think a lot about that a little bit bigger. There is no greater hopeless situation, friends, than the hopelessness of our own condition. We're good at pointing outside, but the greatest hopeless condition that we deal with is right here. 
And I sense that in myself every day. And you sense that in yourself every day. And this guilt that we feel and the burdens that we bear and the, sometimes the lack of peace that we struggle with. And it just weighs on us. The things we say, the things we don't say, and the attitudes that are just there all the time and the anger that comes out and the darkness and the sin. And you see it in yourself and others see it in you and you see it in others and you see it in the world. Friends, on a grand stage, God did not leave us just to sit there and drown in our sin. He loved us too much. And God has already then entered into that hopelessness. He has already dealt with that hopelessness so that we don't have to be hopeless, right? And Jesus Christ then, right, came and he took that sin that causes all the wreckage and all of our failures and the pain and the greed and the pride and all the stuff, right? And he absorbs that and he just takes it. And he says, I love you and you're forgiven. You're forgiven. So that darkness, friends, doesn't get to have the final word, as dark as it might appear to be. He is with us, giving us that life-giving gift and his life-giving presence, and he's not going to leave us. Do you believe that? Do you believe that today, friends? We have much to learn from Elijah, I believe, and I'm excited to dive into this with you, and I think we have much to learn about Elijah's God, the same God who is ours. And again, my, my prayer, my hope is that in these weird, dark days that we live in, that he would raise up men and women and kids with the same spirit of Elijah, this obedient and yet confident in the living God. And that he would give us his strength and his wisdom and his guidance and his confidence and his boldness to simply go through our days serving him. Take a few moments of just private reflection, private thought, private confession, and we'll join together. Let's join together and pray the prayer of confession today from Psalm 51. May this be your prayer today. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me the willing spirit. Father, thank you that you have entered into the mess of our sin. Lord, that you didn't just sort of stand back idly watching uh, sin wreck people. Lord, you entered into it with Elijah, and you're going to do amazing things in the coming weeks that we'll see unfolding. And Lord, you entered into the greatest way of taking our sin on the cross. Is, thank you, Father, for your love for us. It's unearned, completely. Lord, I pray that as we wrestle with just the ugliness of our lives and the ugliness of our society, Lord, that we would, that we would approach things on a theological level. Lord, that we'd see all of us in the same condition of dealing with our sin. Lord, and all of us needing your grace, and your mercy. And Father, teach us all the time to constantly go back to the cross. Teach us, Father, again, all the promises that you have made because of the cross, so that even on a morning like this, that as we confess our sins, Father, you are good and are faithful to proclaim to us full and free forgiveness, not because, just because, but because of the cross. Lord, I pray that the message of the forgiveness of our sins would just land in our hearts, that it would saturate our minds, that it would just sit. And then, Father, as we seek to live for you and all the different vocations that you call us to, Father, I pray that you would work in us the spirit of Elijah that is just unrelentingly stubborn. Father, give us wisdom and, and grace in the midst of that. Show us areas, Father. Help us to love one another. And use us, Father, to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
The Lord also equips his people and strengthens us, not only through his word, but through his table. And with that, then we give great thanks. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let's pray. Father, it is truly good and right and that we should at all times praise you and thank you. Father, for giving us your Son, Jesus Christ, who out of love for his creation humbled himself. Thank you, Father, that you've given us your spirit today to search and to live for you. Father, thank you for the great gift that you work in our lives. And so, Father, as we receive your table today, Lord, as we receive yourself, Lord, may we receive all that comes with that and the promises of gospel, the promises of grace, the promise of power and strength and of presence. And Lord, may this time, this union, this participation with you be a time that nourishes us and feeds us and helps us to grow. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to all to drink saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Come, Lord Jesus. If you are trusting in Jesus today, if you are rejoicing in the gift of salvation, if you know that you are a sinner that needs him, that seeks him every day, man, the table's for you. I invite you to come forward and receive that. Again, we'll have two uh, stations left and right here.
I invite you to stand together. Let's partake. The body of Christ given for us and his blood shed for us. Father, thank you for how you nourish us, how you give us your life. Lord, we need you every day. Lord, I pray that you would just strengthen us today and the days to come. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to remain standing for our final song. I forgot to mention also that we have, obviously, our family meal after the church today. I invite you to stay after and celebrate. And there was an anniversary yesterday that I forgot to mention, Ken and Kay. 45 years. God be praised. Oh. Where? 40. All right. Very good. today as you go. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace and serve him. My voice, I had something.